is speaking on the voice of the social sector startups. Uh, we have three panelists with us. Naveen Mahesh has spent the last 15 years reimagining what must be taught in schools and undergraduate colleges. He is the managing trustee and founder of Head Start Learning Center and has co-founded a number of initiatives in education. In recent years, he co-founded an ecosystem of education called Beyond Eight, a student interest driven and decentralized way of learning. In 2013, Naveen was recognized as an exceptional social entrepreneur, considering his contribution to schools across the globe by Ashoka Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us. Neelam is passionate about making a difference to the transgender community, and she started Periphery after her two year stint with Goldman Sachs. Her goal is to ferry the community towards their passion. She is also a TEDx speaker and advocates for LGBTQIA inclusion at the workplace and in academia. Her target is to pos positively impact the one crore transgender population in India. She orchestrated the management of, India's, of Asia's first and only mainstream event at X Chennai by the transgender crew members of 35 plus people in March 2019. Regila believes that education has the potential to solve all societal problems. Uh, that is the path that led her to Azim Premji University after completing her undergraduation in social work. Her master's degree at this prestigious institution enabled her to develop knowledge and understanding in the space of education with a specialization in school organization, leadership, and management. The complex system and its potential encouraged Rajila to become an agent for positive change, which led her to co-found Vidya Vidya Foundation, a Chennai-based organization committed to ensuring quality education in every school in Tamil Nadu through their school transformation program. I've had the opportunity to speak to all of our panelists, and I'm very excited about the work they do. This conversation will be facilitated by Maya Tyagarajan. Maya is a global educated, Educator having lived and taught in the US, Singapore, and India. She holds a master's in education from Harvard University. Maya is also the author of Beyond the Tiger Mom, East West Parenting for the Global Age, a book on how to raise successful global kids by blending the best of Eastern and Western approaches to parenting and education. In 2017, she returned to her hometown, Chennai, to pursue her dream of starting a company that would recruit, develop, support, and inspire teachers over the span of their career. And that led to the start of tree learning. I will hand it over to Maya now to lead the panel. Thank you all again very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for those introductions, uh, Yeshwani. That was lovely. And I'm so excited to be moderating this panel and to be interacting with all of you. Um, I want to just preface um, the, our session by saying I'm going to be a little bit tight on time. We have three amazing people and I feel like I could talk to each one of you all day um, and learn from your experiences. But given how brief our time is, I may be cutting you off if you, you know, just to make sure that everybody gets a chance to, to speak uh, equally. So please don't take it personally if I do say, okay, we're out of time and we need to move to the next person. Okay. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about the beginning of the journey um, of social entrepreneurship. Right. So when you first start, the first three years are always uh, quite challenging for any organization. So I was wondering if you could each share with me, what are some of the strategies that startups can use to survive their first three years? Um, you may be thinking about funding. Uh, you may be thinking about brand building, about building your team, any of those things. But uh, what are strategies you would recommend? Um, Neelam, shall we start with you? I think you're mute now. There we go. Hi, Maya. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for having us. Uh, thanks, Yashaswini, and everybody else in the team. Um, so, quickly jumping into what you just asked, um, I don't think we really, when we started off, uh, I think we, we started off as people who had absolutely no idea about this space, whether it was in terms of education or whether it was in terms of experience itself. Uh, so we learned a lot of things by falling, by making mistakes. And I think some of the things that really worked out for us was um, uh, always believing in the model of an MVP, a minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. I think that really, really helped us because uh, we didn't think, okay, let's invest uh, 10 lakhs or 5 lakhs and let's secure so much funding and then start it. What we did was we just uh, looked out for the resources that were already available at our disposal. The people who were available were a service-based organization, which means we help transgender community find jobs. So all we did was uh, find five people who wanted jobs 
and actually connect them to organizations and then grow that to 10 and then 20 and then 50 and then 100. So really taking a small uh, strategic approach over there instead of having, you know, to invest and then uh, make a grand uh, journey from there. So I think that really helped. And second thing that was very, uh, I think it, it happened very unconsciously for us. Uh, but we were constantly engaging with the world outside. Uh, I think it was very early on that we realized that we need partners, we need other stakeholders to support our journey. Um, and that, that worked out for us because the team that we have in place right now are, are all people who came to the organization on, our, on their own. And those are some of the best finds that we could have ever had. So yeah, I think those two things have really helped us come so far, just three years now. So yeah. That's wonderful. Wonderful to hear. Um, Regina, do you want to add to that as well and tell us about your experience with the first three years and the beginning of this process? Yes, definitely. So I uh, still remember when uh, Ram, my other co-founder and I, we were just making the decision of starting a social enterprise. And uh, the first thing that we did was to take the what not to do approach. So uh, we did a complete research on what not to do when we uh, start a social enterprise. And uh, the three things that came out very evidently was uh, first to never compromise on the ideology that we believe in, because that is what is going to keep us driving and motivating in what we do. And when you're going to pitch your solution, your idea to people, first the belief should be there on uh, you. So that compromise was something that we made sure that we'd never make. And second was that um, having, a pe having a team or having people with whom we could uh, see the future, uh, with whom we could uh, you know, imagine the uh, hardships as well as the achievements to be celebrated together. So we never ever uh, had people with whom we cannot be with. So definitely we made mistakes, we rectified it. But then we made sure that uh, these mistakes were not repeated. And the third important thing that we kept in mind was never to allow uh, the culture of conflicts to come in between. Uh, so uh, as my co-founder and I, we share a personal relationship also. So we made sure that our personal relationships or our personal bondings, may it be just friends or may it be just husband and wife, how does our personal conflict doesn't influence our decisions, our uh, uh, way of functioning as, as professionals in the organization and I think these three uh, things has helped us to evolve ourselves and um, I should say and I always say this whenever I meet people that uh, we met right people at the right time with the right intent so uh, I think the people whom we met as mentors as our supporters as our partners have uh, uh, got us into this journey and uh, we could survive and achieve at the same time because of the people we had. That's wonderful I feel like you know, just listening to you and Neelam already there's so many things so many wonderful rich takeaways for anyone who wants to start a social entrepreneurship. Um, Naveen, would you like to add to that as well and tell me a little bit about your first three years and some of the challenges and strategies um, that you encountered there? Yeah, uh, morning. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, uh, the entire team, you know, at Kural, um, Vedika, Yash. Um, you know, I'm really happy to sort of see if I can contribute in any meaningful way to this discussion. Uh, I can only, if I look back at my own journey in education, uh, the early years at least, or other startups that I've done, uh, usually it's uh, recognizing that we are working on most things that are already being uh, solved or uh, have been solved somewhere else. Uh, understanding that usually helps and, you know, mm -hmm. not thinking that we're the first ones to ever come, come up with these ideas. Uh, humankind is quite resilient and it's, we face various challenges over the years. And so typically I tend to think that, uh, you know, let's look at the landscape and try and understand who's doing this work and see if we can participate in enabling okay. their work. And typically, I don't try to start by doing something myself for, for myself. I try to do something for someone else uh, because the cause is more important than whether I did something, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I wait a long time before I think that I am not able to do it despite knowing the fact that there are so many other people doing it. And only if I see reason enough to do it after that point, I tend to start up myself. And typically, there are lots and lots of institutional voids in any in any. Uh, uh, sector, the gaps in, uh, in any sector that they work in, right? 
Um, so the impediments are there everywhere and uh, for a thriving uh, market economy, just, you know, uh, you can't wish away these impediments or you can't just uh, sort of say government will uh, throw a mandate and these impediments go away. And it's humanly cost, sometimes policy cost. And so understanding the landscape of the problem, it gives you a bigger picture. Uh, uh, broadly, those are the things that I have sort of kept as a starting point rather than the, you know, in traditional problem solving, we tend to think of uh, things like identify the need uh, so that we can improve something, study it better, do research, do surveys, search for solutions, brainstorm with alternate, uh, with, you know, alternate um, um, opportunities that other people are pursuing bring in experts or establish goals. And it's very, uh, very uh, traditional way of looking at it. Problem solving doesn't, you know, it makes things better, but doesn't change the nature of the problem itself. So I think it's important that we sort of uh, understand that uh, a lot, understand people, understand. And uh, it's very important that we think about uh, depth over speed and relatedness over scale. Uh, their uh, scale is less important, I think, and relatedness is far more important, and speed is far less important, and depth is far more important. I think broadly, that's what I would want to say. I, I don't want to take up too much of I can speak at length at some other time. <laughs> Those are all really wonderful insights. You know, I love the focus on people that all of you have brought in and on relatedness. Um, and also, as Naveen, you, you just said, the, a little bit of humility to kind of understand what's already been done and learn from that as well. So some wonderful responses. Um, one thing I'm, I'm particularly curious about is uh, corporate partnerships. You know, we're all talking here about um, social entrepreneurship where the cause is really driving things, but very often uh, social uh, enterprises do need to partner with uh, corporates either for funding or sponsorship or you know, different kinds of partnerships. Um, so I'm interested in knowing if that's something you've, you've done with your organizations and then how has that influenced, you know, expectations, influences, what, what does that do to your organization? How would you like I, to start? I think we'll like start, start with, yes, sure, Naveen, let's, let's do this in reverse order this time. We'll do Naveen um, and then- I'm okay, I'm okay Naveen. if you had a different plan. I just, no, I don't I'm, know why. I, <laughs> I'm fine with either one. I'm just okay. going to- yeah. Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, corporate associations are usually uh, uh, very necessary in many of these cases. We can't do it all by ourselves. And, uh, you know, um, all of us are relying on various kinds of people bringing in different kinds of resources. And foundations, they typically have uh, an expectations policy itself. Uh, so, you know, no understanding that will give us some insight on what's the right thing to do. What are they expecting out of anybody they invest in? Uh, how are you, they look to see if we are optimizing the resources, right? They're, they're also working with a number of projects at any given time, typically foundations. I'm on the board of a few, uh, you know, organizations, foundations. And so I know how funding is not, uh, is not just about what we do. It's a lot about what the found, uh, funding agency is also looking to do, right? Uh, so understanding how how are their uh, how's their work being optimized through our work is very important. Observing whether the change has occurred, they'll usually uh, uh, not really care about how you went about it. Why, and of course, they want to see that it's ethical and everything, and it's broadly keeping to the plans that you propose. But uh, they will want to see how is change occurring on the ground in any effort that you take. And the relative cost effectiveness, you know, uh, if it, the larger the foundation, they typically be, are sponsoring and funding many organizations like uh, yourselves or your organizations. And so they will be looking at the cost effectiveness of the, uh, the rel relative co cost effectiveness of the different interventions, models or approaches, both uh, in an Indian context, in an international con context. And uh, you, you need more, uh, more and more, I would say, build evidence to persuade people that uh, the things that you're doing are in fact scale, scalable is less important, but it's certainly uh, creating the effect that you want to see on the ground. Um, a lot is obviously possible with money. This is the first and important thing I learned. But uh, we also learned that you, you look to yourself as the most resourceful money or the, or the resource. I would, I would call money also as a resource. And so the last thing you want to do is go and ask for money. Uh, while I know that money is something people tend to think that gives you scale, 
uh, uh, scale is, uh, you know, we get beguiled by the, the ideas that uh, Google's of the world became scalable because of uh, raising money. And lots of my companies do succeed in that manner. Uh, but by and large, uh, I would f look to myself, my family, my relatives as the first resource persons to en enable me in my journey because they understand me, they understand my ideologies, my, the drive, the perseverance I have, the rigor that I'll put into it. And so, uh, I mean, I'll begin there. That's my way of looking at how corporates would be looking at very structured way of looking at things like I pointed out earlier. I hope that it's useful. Um, Rajila, would you like to add to that as well about your experience and has it been similar, <laughs> different, and how you know how do you see things? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, firstly, being a early startup, I think uh, finding a CSR partner itself is a difficult uh, thing to take. Um, uh, for us, it was very difficult because uh, uh, the ATG got delayed from our end, and we didn't have a proper uh, certificate for the CSR uh, uh, compliances. So, um, one thing that uh, we uh, we strategized was that we identified uh, the cause that. Uh, uh, the CSR's cost as well as our cost, how does it align and how much does the CSR's vision and mission aligns with our vision and mission and what is the time commitment that they are also looking at. And based on that, we kind of selected the CSR's that uh, would be interested in a project like us or a solution like us. And um, because we did not have the legal compliances and also uh, the required documentations, uh, I think one support that we took from the social sector is that uh, we identified a partner. So we had a mentor organization who were doing a similar approach and a solution. And I think through that partnership, we established a relationship with the CSR. Uh, and this made it very possible because the cause and the impact that the CSR is looking towards and what we were looking towards was similar. And uh, I think the simple steps or simple structures that we place in when there's a relationship with the CSR, that matters a lot and that influences your action in the field also. So uh, we followed a very simple step that just uh, communicate what are our uh, goals for the program, let it be short term goals or long term goals, communicate it very effectively of how uh, you are going to do, how are you going to monitor it, what are some of the resistance that you are going to ex uh, you know, expect in the field, and how are you going to alter it. And I think this communication has led us a lot of transparency among the CSR and the organization that we are working with. And also we've had a We've had times when the ideologies or um, the interest of the CSR has not aligned with us, and we've sensed that that relationship has not worked very well. So it's just of how, you know, which side of the uh, program that uh, works and uh, just choosing the cause and the alignment of the CSR creates the biggest impact in your action and the impact that you could create. And um, just following these structures has helped us to maintain a good relationship with the CSR and that has also influenced a better effective uh, results in our uh, field also. Yeah, so this is what I felt about the CSR experience. Yeah, and that's really interesting, right? Like, how do you create alignment and what happens if that alignment is not there and the pressure right. that might be created if you're, you know, you're trying to um, kind of cater to, to a CSR funder that doesn't exactly. align with your own <laughs> That's quite challenging. Um, Neelam, would you like to add to that and share your experiences as well? Yeah, um, Maya. So as an organization, Periphery really thrives on corporate partnerships itself. So that's, I think, something also because I came from corporate background myself. Uh, there was a clear need that we understood. Uh, we didn't see it as, okay, we have a social issue and corporates must solve it. Uh, I think the approach is other way around, like bo how both Naveen and Rajula just said that you need to align. You need to identify the problem that you're solving probably for your corporate partner as well. Uh, and for that, for us, it really worked in different ways. So firstly, and aligning with our recruitment goals itself. So companies do have a very strong DNI uh, focus, which means they want to be inclusive of people coming from various backgrounds, various ethnicities, various genders as well. 
um, and we realized early on that you know in the space of transgender inclusion in corporates there was nobody else really aligning with corporates and telling them that hey you know what we're training folks there are people who are available who want jobs can you give jobs um, so i think that way we started forming a recruitment partnership and then as we moved ahead we realized that um, companies are also interested in having their csr aligned with uh, you know something along the lines of inclusion along the lines of uh, transgender empowerment so companies are also interested in uh, having training uh, programs sponsored by them or driving the training initiatives themselves so at the end of it i think it was just constantly engaging with the corporates and understanding what is it that uh, what is it that driving them and we realized that whether it was job whether it was uh, training so all of these things has helped us also uh, you know really move our organization ahead we have a corporate partner named thoughtworks that actually mentors all our folks so it also takes a lot of load and burden off us because we're not trying to solve everything on our own uh, we're utilizing the partnerships that we have and i think corporates are a great place for that uh, provided we know what is it you know what is it that they want as well and if we can match that then nothing like it so yeah i think it's it's more or less what uh, i think all three of us really align with um, and that you know that's really interesting right because if we can see corporates as partners um and i i like what you said about trying to understand where they're coming from and what they want and then once you understand that you can uh, form these partnerships in a way that that is win win for everybody so that's really interesting um so what i'm most interested uh, in this conversation is about your own journeys you know your own personal journey from kind of dream and vision to reality and of course um i know just from tree itself that that that's it's you know it's often a challenging journey right there there are always hurdles opportunities all kinds of things um so what i'd like you to share with me is a little bit just about your own story your own journey from the vision you had or the dream you had and then you know how you made it a reality particularly focusing on uh, maybe the challenges or hurdles because i think uh, if we have people in our audience who are thinking of starting social entrepreneurship so are already working in these kinds of of enterprises uh, th there's so much they can learn from your stories um so rajila let's start with you this time we'll just mix up the order a bit okay <laughs> yes yes sure definitely uh so um uh, so usually uh, when we talk about startup it's considered to be you know stage uh, your year 1 to year 3 but then uh, the zero year or you could call it a seed phase which is uh, basically you start your ideation or you give a, a phase to your uh, uh, solution so that that is the time when we have this big dream of you know uh, okay we want to focus on quality education this is what quality education means because we come from a background where we are, where we understand we study the philosophies of education and we say that you know what education means preparation for life so for life this is all you need and this is all should happen in a school and uh, so all these conflicts and all this um, uh, challenges in the field is something that that we park aside when we think about the dream uh, of for you know delivering quality education and we are like okay if it's a school it should be step 1 step 2 step 3 step 4 the teaching should be innovativeness it should be the school leader should be in this way so there's all these outcomes that you put down and you say that this will happen in year 1 year 2 year 3 of your program and then uh, comes the pilot stage and uh, in the pilot stage you realize that whatever you had dreamt about the outcomes or how i would not achieve it though you are on the path of making your dream a reality but then the uh, hard reality of you know the, the you know just the resistance of teachers you cannot do anything uh, beyond their time beyond their roles or their responsibilities uh, there is going to be a challenge if you are going to involve your stakeholders uh, in any other uh, activities other than what they are uh, defined to do so keeping all this in mind then you restructure your whole approach and you try to see that how both 
the buy in from the stakeholder also comes in because that is the most important thing for your program only when there is an ownership from the stakeholder you are able to create that change that you wish to uh, uh, do uh, for your stakeholder so then the theory of change comes in place the theory of action comes in place where you try to you know uh, see that what works what doesn't work and you change your approach accordingly so even we had to go through this a lot and then right now i would say that i think that's what makes you uh, i come to a point and say that our foundation is strong so uh, right now understanding the challenges understanding the resistance that our stakeholders face understanding the context that we work with what is suitable for them we have a strong program design saying that okay if this is the category of the school this is what will work if this is the category of the school this is what will work if you need to achieve this outcome in a uh, program uh, this is these are the possibilities that you uh, occur, that you can uh, try out so uh, i think though the dream is there but then the way you achieve that dream uh, alters and changes a lot as the journey uh, passes uh, your dream is the same but the way you achieve it the way you approach it might differ and you might always be in the path of innovation and experimenting uh, in this journey yeah wonderful thank you so much for that right that whole idea of you start with a particular vision and then how do you have to continually tweak and revision yes. as you, as you go along um neelam i'm going to have you share and just conscious of time here we have a about 10 minutes so i'm going to have you and navin kind of share a little quickly unfortunately and then we're going to move into questions okay okay um so Done. neelam can you go ahead yeah yeah sure um so i'll i'll, I'll just stick to the personal aspect of it um to be honest i this is something that i really never imagined myself to do so traditionally i come from a marwadi background i've done commerce i went to a uh, investment banking firm and it was all in line with my vision and my family's vision ke ha beti badi hogi paise kamayegi bahut sare paise kamayegi and that's about it uh, so no like like no friends but i think this is what traditionally i thought of my life and uh, my family thought of it as well but what really happened was i think when i entered my workplace while i started working in goldman although i loved the work and the people over there it was never really in line with how i you know how i felt fulfilled or how i saw myself making any difference or just making any impact anywhere um and so that's when i started doing things outside of my work and that was the step one for me because hadn't i done that i wouldn't be here today so just going outside of my work as uh, doing some outreach even within the company there was a very strong uh, dni network which is diversity and inclusion network that heavily focused on um, inclusion of transgender people of lgbt community and and things like that so that was my first time when i got introduced to uh, you know having and met transgender people in a workplace not on the street not in the way that we usually see them so that experience those experiences actually really molded me and um, made me understand that there was a problem and uh, there is a clear need for it i think that's that's when the thought really started so it took me a while before i quit my job um, i i actually didn't even tell my parents that i was going to quit for this i just told them that coming back to family business so we'll we'll kill it uh, but yeah i came back and i started doing other things and it was still a long way long long journey i think i spent a year on the field just understanding the market understanding what the community feels like spending a lot of time over there because uh, you know you really have to empathize and more so you need to understand the problem that you are trying to solve and like you said are there people who have already done this uh, is uh, there are so many other ngos and cbs who do fabulous work in this space so why only employment is something that i need to work on so answering all of those questions took me a year plus and after that is when periphery actually started um and i did have amazing set of friends who really supported me through all of this so i i think a lot of things came together uh, my vision didn't really translate in a day um and yeah i i think it took like almost two years on but it was worth the entire ride that's great i love the personal story right and the the, the sort of risk in moving out of your comfort zone and doing what you actually cared about um that's a wonderful story thank you so much neelam um and we're going to wrap up with navin um navin can you share a little bit about your story from whichever angle you choose but that uh, you know from 
dream and vision into reality. And uh, so please share. I, thank you. I, I, you know, Neelam sort of summed up uh, the story of most entrepreneurs. You don't, you don't just follow uh, other people's passions and interests. And the only thing when I came to India, you know, I was running a, uh, secondary market execution system that had nothing to do with education. When it sold, we came back to India and I, all I was thinking about was uh, taking care of my parents. That's all. The, I came back and said, if you have a job, I'll do the, I'll do the job. I didn't have any big uh, idea about what I'd do. But, uh, you know, I think we need to, st we can't start any venture or organization by thinking about the end point so much because oftentimes there's so many pivots that will happen like uh, Regila pointed out, you know, I think uh, you don't know the destinations and you, it's better not to keep destinations as goals themselves. So I did, if I had thought that uh, uh, March of this year, I would be going and telling Howard how to move from pedagogy to hutagogy. I would have never, I would have said, yeah, how, how, really funny. <laughs> Tell me some more jokes, right? Uh, 15 years back. But uh, to be able to do that today and have Howard call us and say that, uh, you know, they were humble enough to say, I don't know anything about what you're doing, but it sounds like you're on the right track is an amazing uh, journey, but it didn't happen by design. It just happened. Uh, you take one step at a time. Uh, the way I looked at it was, uh, like I said, I, uh, you know, I've uh, raised venture capital money now and before, and I've raised uh, foundation money now and before. And um, foundation money for small projects are a little bit easier. The timelines are easier, but continual projects uh, are so dependent on so many different factors. Uh, venture capital funding is another challenge also. So I, like I pointed out, I relied on myself as the first resource. I said, whatever money I have, I'll put it. You know, if you don't bet on yourself, there's nobody else going to bet on it, right? And I studied, I spent a lot of time studying schools in Tamil Nadu, uh, visiting schools. My mom was a teacher. So everybody said, oh, you're Sudha's son, come sit in on our classes. And so there was no uh, fear in letting me into their ecosystems. And I didn't go there threatening also. I just wanted to understand uh, the perspective of different stakeholders like children, schools, parents, community members, right, and framework developers. And I've come to the point, come, uh, the journey has been mostly self-reliant and thinking about team of teams. Um, there was a point Reg uh, Regila made about, uh, you know, how oversight of people and other things uh, is also essential. I've honestly found the opposite. I usually tend to look at inversions in most things. Can students be teachers, owners be employees, you know, uh, we create the future, not the past, right? <laughs> and so I tend to look at uh, people. I surround myself with people far better than me. That's my skill, honestly. I've always believed that if I look to people who are far greater than I am at most things, and they are, uh, or invariably I'll find almost in everything I do, there are better people at it than I am. But uh, the culture building has been the found bedrock of uh, anything I have worked on. If the culture fit is not there, I mean, there's typically people talk of three kinds of organizations uh, where you say talent oriented organizations, um, you know, or uh, uh, past oriented organizations who has achieved what, right? Talent oriented organization is the promise of what people can do by bringing them together. But culture oriented organizations are trying to understand, engage with people and just understand people better and see if there is a fitment there. And then you move forward after that. In fact, oftentimes I tell my colleagues only to rest, go on vacations, uh, don't work so much, take care of yourselves. I try to uh, look at the things that they don't look at because they're so committed into the ideology because they own those ideologies. And so whenever I have, and I've started lots of things and failed at many more than I've succeeded in, uh, if anything, I can share as a learning from all, both the uh, failures and the successes. It's typically uh, uh, be humble, know, know that there are far greater people than you and uh, far more people have tried the same things before you and, uh, and recognize that uh, change is a slow process. I mean, this pandemic, if anything, it should teach us the, that, right? Uh, everybody's uh, scampering to find solutions. You don't find solutions overnight. Somebody said, oh, now we have technology. The first university that was entirely online was in 1996. We've had technology to teach online from 1996. So it's not a new problem. So I think we are, I tend to look at people and uh, culture more than other things. Wonderful. Wonderful. You know, I, I love all of the things that have come up today because it's, I think all three of your stories are so inspiring and there's so much 
um, in some ways overlap in terms of looking at the power of people, of culture, um, of understanding. I mean, that's a word I've heard over and over again, you know, trying to understand where others are coming from, what their needs are, and, and understanding others as well, as well as a commitment to a particular cause and ideology. Um, so I, I, I feel like I've learned a lot and it's been really inspiring. Um, we are running very close to time, but I have a couple of questions from the audience. One is about advice for young people who are joining the uh, social sector without having uh, a private sector job detour. So if they come right into the social sector, is that, you know, do you think that's advisable? Uh, does it help to do something like what Neelam, you said you did where you were working in the private sector first? Um, so yeah. that's one question. Uh, would someone like Can to we take, take that one question? at a time and answer rather than yeah. try and answer? Yeah, I think that uh, let's do it that way. Okay, go ahead, um, Naveen. Yes. I'm just going to point I, out that each of you has about one minute. So this is really yeah, about yeah. as succinct as you can. Uh, one yeah. minute for your advice, okay? Won't take more. Uh, sure. Fundamentally, yes, you must not go to jobs first. Uh, uh, the world needs producers, not consumers. You need to be able to be a citizen. It means to produce the future, not to consume the future that someone else created for, for you. So you will never learn a thing by going and working somewhere else. You, you'll, you first need to learn about yourself, what you're, what you're capable of, your ability to uh, put yourself through rigor and perseverance and hardships and uh, understand people. Your humility also and risk is best taken early. If you, I, mean, I come from a financial world and where we say risk is early, uh, but in education world, well, everybody says take risk later. It's actually not true. You should take risk early. If you want to do something, do it now. Uh, try all the things that you want to do now. So I yeah. celebrate uh, Regila and Neelam and all the younger people in the world. You are the change makers and I, I salute you for taking these steps early, not later. Uh, experience working in corporate won't help you at all working in uh, as an entrepreneur in the NGO sector. Just get your feet wet, get your hands dirty, uh, you know, get doing rather than trying to read and go to corporate life and learn the same things. I hope I stayed under a minute. Yeah, I'll just quickly <laughs> add to that. Yeah. Uh, just one half a minute, probably. Um, you know, I really resonate with what he said. Take the risk early, uh, you know, do the grind. But I think another important factor is your work ethics. Uh, for a lot of people, those work ethics shape in doing some job or something else before they really, you know, venture into their dream project itself. That's just my thought. I really believe that work ethics need to be really, really strong. You need to, you, know, you shouldn't be like, I am a founder, I will do only this kind of a job or I will have a team and they will do all of this. Um, so I think those things you learn and the humble and the humility to do any job and to grind at it 24 seven or as much as you can only comes with some work experience. So I think that has helped me, but uh, yeah, we'll see what works for everyone. So. Maya, can I add? Yes, please do. I am the best example for this question because I had no work experience anywhere. I did my bachelor's in social work. I did my master's in education and I'm here in Vidyavade right now. I would just say one thing that if you strongly believe in yourself and you have the confidence that you can manage on your own, Take that step because more than anyone around me, I am proud about myself that I've grown this much in just these three years. So if you're confident, go ahead. <laughs> so wonderful uh, advice from all three of you. Um, I'm going to wrap things up now. We do have a couple of other questions. So what I'm going to say to our uh, audience members who sent in questions is we'll take these offline and then maybe I'll share them with the panelists and try to send them back to uh, audience members um, uh, later, okay? So, but finally, a big, big thank you to all three of you, Rajila, Naveen, and Neelam. I feel like I've learned a lot. It's been really inspiring, and I'm sure our audience members have also taken away a lot. Um, so thank you very, very much, and I hope we'll our paths will cross again at some point. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, speakers. We had so much to learn from you, me especially, being a startup social entrepreneur myself. And thank you very much, Maya, for facilitating that conversation and enabling all our speakers to share their insights. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adi.